Richard Glover, welcome to Booktopia. Thank you for the invitation. Now, Flesh Wounds, this book I think starts with a game, doesn't it? Yeah, I talk about this game that I developed in young adulthood called Who's Got the Weirdest Parents? Mm. And I still recommend it as a fabulous uh, game for any dinner party which is slowing down. <laughs> um, you just go around the table and you ask everyone you know, to compete for the prize. Who's Got the Weirdest Parents? And it's a fabulous game if only because you realise um, how in the uh, families of your seemingly normal friends what frothing insanity exists. And, and after a few rounds of that game, you never look at the red roofs of suburbia ever again without thinking, my God. And, and there's always someone on the table who'll say, um, oh, well, look, that sounds fun, but I can't play because my parents were really, really boring and normal. And at that point, everyone else says, oh, come on, you must have one story. And they say, oh, oh well, I, I guess, I guess unless you count... And then there'll come some <laughs> fabulous story. And I remember one particular friend who said exactly that, you know, I, could, I can't play. And then he said, well, unless you count the way my dad couldn't stand the idea of my mother touching his underwear in any way, so built a laundry in the garage and would come home from work and launder his own underpants before coming into the house. And, and we all said, yes, that's sort of the story. <laughs> But when you were playing that game, given what we now know from Flesh Wounds, I mean, your story would have to have beaten mm, everyone no, else. No, that's what's that weird, all? you see. That's, what, that's what's weird. And I'd say this about the book too. Look, the book has got some, uh, you know, I hope fabulously eccentric stories in it. But the book is not really claiming that this family is, 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 is particularly bad or particularly awful. I think my point about the book is that... You know, if you, if you ask, again, you know, a, a group of friends, um, did you have the sort of parent... Did your parents give you the sort of love that you would want to give to a child of your own? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, a startling it's question, a question to, yeah. to ask people. Um, and, you know, I think that maybe 60% of people would say, yeah, they weren't perfect, but they kind of did. But I reckon maybe 40% of people will say, no, my, my parents didn't give me the love that I would want to give a child of my own. Nothing like it. And what's interesting about that is that even though this is such a, a big collective experience, not all of us are mad or drug addicted or, you know, <laughs> uh, knocked by... I mean, some of us are, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not um, saying that these things are always survivable, but for a lot of people they are survivable. Mm. And this is the amazing resilience of human beings, that, that we find the love elsewhere we find a way of finding the love elsewhere. And even if you've missed out on that parental love, um, there's, there's ways of being resilient to it that most people actually seem to achieve. And I think that's important to say out loud, partly because we have this whole language about parental love. Um, it's deep in our language. We, we talk about um, dogs and their uh, pup, you know, uh, uh, dogs and their puppies and cats and their kittens and cows and their calves. And, uh, and, and, and we say, look, a mother, a mother's love for a child is in the DNA. It's inexorable. It's built into our biology. Mm. And that's kind of true, and yet there are so many barriers to its effective delivery. There's drug addiction and a dad who lost his job and a mum who's taking too many pills and, and all sorts of even more eccentric reasons than that. In, in my case, if it doesn't sound too, too, uh, too odd, it's maybe the British class system and my mother's attempt to escape it was the barrier to that effective delivery of love, but we survive it. So Richard, at what point did you realise that your mother wasn't like other mothers? Because it's really only when you venture into other people's houses that you've got as yeah, an yeah. object of comparison. I guess, look, I think the big su surprise was, uh, you know, it all comes to a head really uh, when at the point she leaves. So when I'm 15, she runs off with my English teacher from school who she'd met at parent-teacher, which somehow <laughs> makes it worse, I think. Um, so, you know, in term two, my mother disappeared, and so did my English teacher. And um, kind of hilariously, in a way, my father was so heartbroken by this, he left too. I mean, he went back to England for a while. He, 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 he uh, moved a friend into the house after a while to look after me, and then he came back himself after a while. But uh, I remember at the time one of my friends... Um, saying, because you know, my friends loved this house with no adults in it, but a, a fridge and a pool. Party and, central. You know, this is not a misery memoir. There, there was a pool in this house. Um, but, uh, you know, one of my friends said, yes, yes, Richard never really left home. Home left him. <laughs> <laughs> no, unnecessarily <laughs> accurate. Um, but, 
you know, my father did come back in the end and uh, it was all fine and I finished school and then when I was 18 I did what lots of um, kids do, I suppose. I decided to go back to the old country, in this case England, and see some relatives. And so I got my father's relatives from him, the details, and then I rang up my mother who, you know, all this time had been living in this strange Tolkien-inspired <laughs> nudist <laughs> colony of which there's plenty in the book, yeah. with teddy bears and other strange things. Um, but I rang her up and, and you know, asked her for all the relatives on her side of the family. And she told, this, told me this, she refused. She said, no, she wouldn't give me their details. And she told me this story, which she told, you know, half remembered from childhood, although I'd never really paid much attention to it. But it was the story of how, you know, she was born into this aristocratic family, an only child, and they'd sent her away to boarding school when she was just five years old. And she understood that they, they were that class of people who did that sort of thing, but still she held it against them because it was in the desire to escape this terrible school when she was 16 that she'd sort of, or, or 18, that she'd run into the arms of my father in his small, smart World War II uniform and uh, married him, can't, gone to Australia, had me, and in, in her mind all the disasters that ensued um, were all the fault of her parents sending her to that school. So no, she would not give me those, uh, those numbers. So I go anyway, of course, and I see my father's sister, Auntie Audrey, and three cousins who I'd never met, fantastic time. And after a while, Auntie Audrey says, oh, well, you'll be going to see your mother's folks now. And I say, oh, no, Auntie Audrey, you know, posh, aristocrat, board, boarding school, smart World War II uniform, you know. Uh, da -da. Um, uh, 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 so no, no. And she says, aristocratic, posh? <laughs> Only child. And she says, would you like to see a picture of your mother and her sisters? What sisters? Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. And so she goes upstairs in a little house. I hear her rummaging around in the cupboards. And she comes back down with one of those little tiny black and white photographs. Mm. And she hands it over. And I, it's clearly my mother. I can recognise her. And she's there with her two sisters and the parents. And they are so clearly northern working class. I mean, the northern working class as rendered by Monty Python. I mean, the father virtually has a hanky on him, he said. And I say, oh, you know, they look lovely. And my auntie says, oh, well, they were lovely. But she was embarrassed. She was embarrassed by them. Um, she was embarrassed by the fact that they were working class. Um, and not that my father was posh. Mm. Um, in fact, she said um, she wouldn't let them come to the wedding. But they came anyway and stood in the rain, throwing confetti. Yes. I mean, it's such a kind That's of... heartbreaking. It's a heartbreaking it? image, isn't it? And when you saw that picture, when you were confronted with that, right in that moment, did you not feel a surge of anger? No. And I think part of... You know, a lot of the book is a, is a kind of dance with that idea, really. You know, there's this big idea, isn't there, in self-help literature that you've got to... You know, confront the truth about your parents that you must speak to them before they die you must do all, all these things and you know my way has always been um, to sort of sidestep a lot of these things to hold them at, at, at some distance mm -hmm. to concentrate on the parts of my life which have been healthy mm -hmm. to hear those good voices that, that, rather than, yeah. the, than the bad voices and, and some of the book is a debate about whether that, that's good or good enough and maybe it isn't and maybe it is but certainly at that point I, I, I think I was much more interested in the fact that the three gorgeous cousins were about to take me horse riding down the road to be honest. <laughs> To and of honest. course, there is a great sting in the tail of this story. I'm not going to give this mm -hmm. away because it is a delicious twist and irony that she had all these kind of um, illusions of yes, grandeur. Yes. And there's a, there's yes. a wonderful she'd payoff have just to stuck that. She'd have just stuck book, around. We that, won't talk about right. that. And there is also another part of the book. I know you tend to go much more towards the light than the dark. You skim, to some extent, over some very dark moments in your teenage years mm. in London when you are sexually abused, was that very difficult to write about? Um, yes, uh, well, it was, and it, and it was a terrible, terrible time. Um, you know, I say in the book that the book is not Angela's Ashes, but it is kind of a bit like John Fowles' The Collector, yeah. you know, in that I was really, you know, at least figuratively locked in this dungeon with this quite evil character, and it went on for a long time. It went on for something like six months or eight months, and... Um, and, uh, you know, and I think, again, it, 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 it did grow out of the vulnerability that I had, that, that if you have a child that's effectively not being parented, that if effectively the parents have gone missing, mm. you, you are, it is like every pedophile in the world is on some sort of, um, you know, text alert that you were there and, and you're, you are vulnerable. And, uh, you know, and I think, I, I hope I've written that um, with clarity and honestly 
and, and honesty in, in, in why you put up with it is the interesting thing when I look back at it. And I, you know, I think that's a combination of the fact that these people do um, chew away at yourself. You know, that's their modus operandi, actually, is they kind of reduce you to nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and by stripping you of all your, your, your dignity and willpower and, um, and, and self-esteem, they, they make you... Um, they make you vulnerable. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't think that chapter, um, you know, that it was incredibly sad at the time. What um, th th that period of my life. Mm -hmm. But I think the, you know, the point I'd make about that chapter is, is I, is, is again, I don't think that has been a defining thing in my life. I think you it was, haven't let it. It was terrible at the time, but I, yeah, I haven't let it. And and um, I think again, um, you know, there's been a lot of very strong, good voices in my life, and I've tried to listen to those. Mm. So Richard, I can't let you go without going back to something that you just mentioned in passing. You mentioned that your mother had these teddy bears, and in the second half of the book, she's in Noosa, she's ensconced with Mr Phillips, and all these stuffed bears. toys. Yes. What is going on there, exactly? Well, I think they loved whimsy. You know, they had this idea... It, they had very much a fortress relationship, the English teacher and, and her. They lived in Armadale in country New South Wales, in this house out of town, uh, obsessed with Tolkien. Uh, um, they, you know, she had, a, she had a, a car with Bilbo Baggins number plates, and, and the place was called Doriath, which I've looked up since. And in the world of Tolkien, Doriath is a particular... I didn't know this at the time. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's an enchanted girdle is his phrase for it, in, Girl, in which the queen has given the king a spell so that only with the king's permission can people enter the sanctity of Doriath. So it's a very particular mm. idea. I mean, it's her way of saying, it's their way of saying, you know, get stuff to the world, really. Yeah. This we're is, in our kingdom. We're in our kingdom. And I think they had this idea of, of themselves as these sort of two British aristocrats unaccountably detained in a country town on the wrong side of the world, surrounded by morons, you know, with their self-image. And, you know, I remember the, 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 uh, my favourite chapter in the book, really, because it's a, one of the funny chapters, is, is taking my wife, my partner, Deborah, there for the first time. So we were kind of probably 22 or something like that, and we drive up from Sydney to, to Armadale. And, and when, we, when, we, when we walk in, you know, there's, there's the teddy bears all lined up mm -hmm. like they're a... A welcoming party. Yes, like with, the star. Yes, hello, young Deborah and young Master Richard, um, <laughs> all this sort of stuff. And so, they, and, and they're very sort of formally dressed. And, and my mother does this sort of strange little sort of abbreviated haka, which I think is her way of, you know, expressing pleasure that you've arrived without touching you because she yes. didn't want to touch anyone. Um, and so that happens, uh, and, and Deborah's sort of reeling from this. And they say, well, do you want to have a swim? And so, oh, okay. So we change, we go into the little bedroom and change to our swimming pool. By the time we go, in, go to the pool, which is really five minutes after we've arrived, um, my mother's in the pool and Mr Phillips is naked. Mm. He's got a terry toweling hat on and nothing else. He's mm. entirely naked. And we sort of sit down on these pool lounges and he says, you know, drink, drink anyone. And then, you know, comes back... <laughs> sort of standing there, standing there next to Deborah, you know, <laughs> with, with her perfect head height, you know, with, with, the, with the donger and um, with the glass of soda water and, and, and all of that. And so, and, uh, you know, and, and Deborah's sort of leaning this way and <laughs> went to try to avoid it. And so you've got this very strange world where there's the nudism there. And then, again, you know, five minutes later, you'll be called to dinner or something, and it'll be incredibly formal again. And he'll be wearing his Oxford jacket that he earned, you know, 40 years previously, and his Jesus College tie and these sort of slacks, you know, sort of fawn trousers. And you'll be sitting around this sort of immensely formal dinner table. And then, and then um, you know, whenever, whenever anything testy happens... You know, because, you know, my mother and I, you know, any time my mother is left alone with me, she, she would say, thank you for finding Mr Phillips. As, you know, as, as if I was the agent of my yes. parents' own divorce. It was a very peculiar thing that I found, because he was my English teacher, I found him for her. That you brokered this or had any yeah, agency that, that, in That's it. right, that's right. And, 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 um, and then she would go into these sort of long things about my father. I mean, one of the things I really, one of the 
hopeful. I, one of the points of the book, I think, is is to say to people who are getting divorced, don't do that. You know, don't. You know, I must have had five million discussions with my parents. Every the, the hello, how are you? Of every conversation with either of them was how terrible the other one was. It's it's a terrible thing to it do, is. actually. But anyway, so she would be starting going on about my father, and I would be getting tense and saying, "Mum, I don't want, I don't want to have this." And and then then of course Mr. Phillips would come in with one of the soft toys and say, "Hello, my name is Gombrel." <laughs> you have to break off the argument with your mother and say, "Hello, Gombrel, how are you?" Or no, Mr. Toad from Toad, you know, we, we, we know. nobody's noticed my fine waistcoat. Oh yes, Mr. Toad, it is. Fine. So all through, um, uh, yeah. So it's a, this very strange combination of nudist colon, colony, Tolkien appreciation society, um, and uh, yeah, a stuffed Te- teddy bear club. Well, look, it's mm. it's a miracle that you are not a basket case. <laughs> you have written a fabulous, yeah. fabulous book. Thank you so much, Richard Glover. Well, it's not just me. It's a miracle that most people aren't basket cases, and we're not. And we're resilient. Thank and that's God the, we are. And that's the point. Thank you. Thank you.